Peter, welcome back to the show. Welcome back to Become Your Own Superhero. We were blessed to have you uh, share all your, well, some of your wonderful knowledge in the first episode. And we brought you back a second time because it was just so much to, to share with the world. And this episode, we're going to start off with some of the focus on plant nutrition versus animal nutrition and why that's important for the human race. It's great to be back. Thank you for the chance. Um, well, I guess I would sum it up to say that there is such a thing as too little animal source food in human diet. And there's, I would call it a false narrative that there's such a thing as too much. Now, in between those, you know, the, I know many individuals who seem to require very little plant source food in their diet in order to reverse some long-standing chronic conditions. Um, but other people, they can um, thrive um, with a variety of plant source foods. And so I want people to understand that they should feel free to explore and find out what works for them, understanding what the potentials are. And then in addition to that, we have this conversation to the degree that it's an actual conversation now about how the world needs to shift, humanity needs to shift to a plant source diet for a number of reasons. And the truth is, humanity's diet is already plant-based. The majority of calories, the majority of protein in humanity's diet, when you look across the globe, is coming from plant sources. And when you understand the fundamental superiority of animal source food, you begin to understand why it's a problem when people are trying to supply their protein needs from cereals, for example. So wheat and maize and oats and rye and barley and those crops. Humanity gets more of its protein from cereals than from all animal source foods combined. And wheat alone at about 20% is larger than any single animal source food category. Now this is FAO data. So we, we need to have a understanding of what, what's actually going on if we're going to make improvements, if we're going to develop truly sustainable food systems and the societies that depend on them. Wow something that just popped into my head of the that 20 percent wheat figure how much of that land could be used to to put ruminant animals onto and use and to grow animals on well in some cases there's no competition in in parts of the southern south central plains here in the united states uh, it's not uncommon to graze wheat pasture for the winter time and then remove those animals before the flower in the wheat plant begins to elongate up into the plant. So it is possible to get dual use out of the same ground. Um, and wheat also is produced in rotation with other crops. We, we don't just have wheat being produced. Now on the more dry land, areas of the world, you can actually have wheat being produced only every other year, for example, because they have to let moisture accumulate in between crops, uh, probably familiar with that in parts of Australia. So what's clear is that we have tremendous capacity and potential that we haven't begun to uh, explore and exploit. Um, and part of that is because of we, 
one is market forces, economics drive innovation. Um, but on the other hand, we just don't have the vision um, in some of our leadership to say, no, animal source food is an essential for sustainable development. There's, there's no, um, it, it's, it's not even that it's not competitive, it's that it's fundamentally essential um, for proper human development so that you can have people who can reach their potential and contribute to various aspects of society. So um, when you have 25% of children globally that are five or under that are stunted, you're talking not just physical stature, but you're talking mental development and cognitive ability being restricted because poor quality diets. And so that then creates a drag on economic development. And there's several other examples that you can go into. And, and you know, I mentioned specifically protein, but there's a long list of nutrients that are solely or best sourced out of animal source foods. Now, as the sod father of the Ruminati, of course, I promote the consumption and enjoyment of things like beef and dairy and lamb and goat and venison and those. But in some parts of the world, it's going to be fish. In others, it's going to be poultry. Maybe it's swine. It's certainly eggs everywhere that we can possibly have that. Um, so there's a, there's a range of these foods that we just have to have people with the understanding that how do we develop localized uh, um, appropriate systems to give people the opportunity for economic development as well as adequate essential nutrition. One of the things that just sprung to mind, Peter, was the there's a lot of feral camels roaming across the deserts of uh, the desert of Australia that were introduced at some point, maybe in the late 1800s. Um, how nutritious is something like camel meat to feed a big population of the world? Well, I, I think that there's a number of people, North Africa, Middle East, that eat camel. Now, I'm not that familiar with it. I'm not ha f that familiar with how efficient they are in terms of converting resource, but clearly they're adapted to a very uh, challenging environment. And so they're one more resource. Um, one, I was just reading a book the other day and it made me aware of how human beings will deplete wildlife if they don't have access to farmed animal source foods. And so increasing farm productivity with um, adapted varieties of both forage and animals or systems that fit the environment, <clears throat> that actually can spare wildlife. Um, because it lessens the demand for those animals for food. And that's an important thing in some parts of the world. So, I mean, I, I, I know that there's um, dairy products from camels as well as meat. And obviously they've been used for transportation. They would be culturally important of some people. And um, so uh, one more resource we've been given. Well, they're a pest and they, and I have seen camel milk for sale at some of the higher end department stores here, like the David Jones, um, which is like a Bloomingdale's, I suppose you'd mm. um, be equivalent to. It was $18 a litre. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like even wow. the curiosity side of me uh, couldn't justify that kind of, that kind of um, price. But um, right. yeah, from a, from a pest point of view, they do cause quite a bit of damage. They are introduced, as I said. So sure. You know, but and they and they grow and they they flourished in that desert environment. Not surprisingly, so it's just mm -hmm. yeah, it's an interesting one. From from a um, from a simplicity point of view, have you got any ideas, Peter, with regards to in a utopian world, what we can do from now 
to really sort this whole problem out with nutrition and crops and monocropping and chemicals and feeding the planet and, and not getting stunted children. Have you got any ideas regarding what, what is possible and what's on the horizon? Well, I'm, I'm suspect of the word utopia because um, I, I think that that's been sold to people over the history of mankind to justify a number of problems. Um, I think that we have the opportunity to focus on improving the flourishing of men and women globally. I think that there are real, I think that there are issues that are currently not receiving attention for any number of reasons that need to receive that attention so that people can enjoy better, more secure lives, and that that will lead to prosperity that then enables us to engage in other activities like conservation, like um, uh, pollution control, like more security from um, any number of natural threats to human health and well-being. Um, I think that there are political issues that need to get sorted out. Um, and, and clearly, there are vast subjects beyond the knowledge or expertise of a forage agronomist and ruminant nutritionist. Um, but I, I think that if we could get toward Oh, I just heard a phrase. I, I, I can't recall the word order, but it was something like um, an environmental humanist or a hu you know, humanistic environmentalist. Basically, that idea of our brothers and sisters are our primary concern. And when we focus on issues that way, we might be able to see problems from a bigger perspective rather than just the perspective of a high income nation citizen looking at the rest of the world and thinking we know how to tell them we know what to tell them to solve the problems that they face day in and day out meanwhile there are these other issues that are very pressing and probably are a greater security threat than many things that people get all excited about. So um, I, I would, part of the challenge for us is we each have to be open to constantly asking ourselves, why do I believe the things that I believe? What's that based on? Do have I seen anything to suggest that maybe I shouldn't be so confident in that? It's a very challenging thing for any human being to do that. Um, so, you know, this may be in the line of here, take my advice, I'm not using it. Um, we, we, we need to be sure, though, that we're operating outside of this kind of unthinking generational uh, learning kind of myth and narrative and the sort of thing that we've seen for the last half century in human nutrition ought to be very illustrative to us about the sorts of things we need we can't afford to do going forward yeah the the thing that i've been thinking about a lot recently peter is this whole and I and I use that utopian word loosely, obviously, but from my own personal experience, the energy that I've gained, the drive that I've received, the productivity that's gone through the roof, all since I've started looking after myself, and and is all centered around the nutrition that I eat, which is mainly animal protein. I wonder how far we could advance as a as a human race, how much quicker we could do it if we have more people eating the right stuff to solve more of the world's problems and the problems, problems are good. You know, problems mm. give us an opportunity to try and solve them. And, mm. you know, cause it, 
if you if you fast forward a thousand years, assuming the planet hasn't spun off its axis through COVID, what's the population number going to be? Assuming they haven't decided to do, do population control. Well, actually, so there's a couple things. One is uh, I'll just push back, mostly because I've become aware of it. We tend to we we tend to focus on protein when we talk about animal source food, and we need to make sure that we're we know we're talking about every essential nutrient can be supplied from animal source food. Um, one of my lines is, if you can't get it from animal source food, you don't need it. Um, now, maybe it's enjoyable, whatever. So just put that off to the side and 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 forget that. Um, the Yes, when the human engine is properly fueled, remarkable things can happen. Um, when you look at what our ancestors routinely accomplished, um, when you look at the development of modern Homo sapien, it, it, it's remarkable. Um, the, and, and part of, part of the challenge is we have too many people who look at humans as if they're not part of nature. And then they look at nature good and they look at human bad. And that's a weird sort of belief system by my understanding, but it's, it's there and it's very prevalent. Um, but when, uh, I guess another thing I push back on is there, I, I, I know, and I'm sure you know, a lot of people who are convinced that they're doing what they're supposed to do to be healthy, mm -hmm. right? That I might, I might think that they're sincerely wrong, but they truly believe what they're doing. Their doctor told them, you know, their friend who's a trained dietitian told them, or, you know, they heard it on TV from somebody that they respect for some reason. So we got to be open to how to communicate with people, provide information and do it in a way that doesn't shut things down. I, I think there's some study in the subject of persuasion that would suggest if we, if we don't attend to that, we could actually inhibit change by how we engage in the conversations. So, you know, we could respond to somebody's beliefs in a way that just locks them down even harder. Somebody a long time ago, I, I picked this up, said, if every man is an island, our job is to paddle around until we find the right beach to land on. A lot of this has to be driven through personal relationships. I mean, top down doesn't, isn't probably the most effective at this point. Um, I, I think that we need to find ways to broaden this message and get as many people aware, encourage them so that they can have their own personal experience and then reach that tipping point where the change just accelerates. And I think market will respond to that in a heartbeat. <laughs> Because I just they, they they look for that kind of stuff. I know that there are people that would not be happy to see that happen, but oh well, the buggy whip manufacturers probably weren't happy. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's just it's just what happens. Um, so I I, I th and and can you imagine in the U.S. I don't know the Australian figures. Forgive me, bad guest. Um, in the U.S., the direct and indirect cost of obesity and metabolic illness has been estimated to be somewhere like 1.7 trillion U.S. dollars, um, and that's equivalent to 9.3 percent of GDP. Now, that's somebody's interest there, but imagine if that cost could be eliminated from the system and leveraged onto other issues that are currently pressing. Um, every 30 seconds, someone in the world loses a lower leg due to diabetes. And a significant number of those are happening in 
low and middle income countries. And imagine as bad as that is in the United States, imagine the trajectory there. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, I'm optimistic. I, I, I think that we really need some leadership in a number of different realms at a number of different levels who can catch the vision and then push it. I had the pleasure of interviewing Professor Tim Noakes last mm -hmm. week. And I said to him, have you ever thought about running for prime minister or president? And he just laughed and, and he had sort of no interest in it. And I said, well, maybe I should run for prime minister. And he laughed and he said, I think you'd be too honest. But uh, all that aside, do we need someone who, you know, like me, for example, to take this and get the top job and start influencing from, from the, the upper echelons of, of where decisions are made? Yeah, uh, it, it's a tricky thing. First of all, um, you know, go for it. <laughs> um, campaign <laughs> starts tonight. Um, and I'm sure my endorsement will carry significant weight in Australia. Um, You'd be surprised. Yeah, but I think part of the problem is this top down. And, you know, the more centralized anything gets, the more accessible it is to people who promote a special interest. Right. So, so that's a, that's a problem. We, we clearly need to get policy sorted out because policy tends to influence other things. And I could talk about a number of them, but so, so policy needs to get more closely aligned with what current research would suggest is an appropriate path forward. Um, but a lot of this is on the individual. It has to be. Now I understand that there's large there, there there are parts of our societies where people depend on aid or they're being fed by systems and and I recognize those and 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 there's a there's a way that bad policy influences how those people are fed and they're fed poorly so uh, that has to be sorted out but again the vast majority of people who are not challenged in that way have not been given the information that you and i and others have been given and part of my mission is to make sure that they have a chance to hear that or be introduced to people that could um give them that information. I, I was just talking earlier with someone and in academia, we're, we're taught, we're trained to, a, a, as our training advances, it becomes deeper and deeper, but narrower and narrower until we know a great deal about a relatively specialized area. And, and we're taught to stay in our lane, to not talk about those other areas. And the problem is we're faced with an interconnected world. We're faced with complex problems and we're faced, I hate to say it this way, but we're up against people frequently that don't operate with that stay in your lane mentality. And in fact, they will make things up <laughs> and they get it out and people buy, you know, just they buy into that messaging. And what we need to do is build the bridges between those silos and, and get the connection across between all these expertise. But individually, each of us eats, you know, anyone with the responsibility for the care and feeding of at least one human being needs to hear a message about what metabolic health means. What are meaningful markers? What is meant by adequate essential nutrition and how do you go about getting that? What things do you look for? What things are there that may then be considered as at least uh, optional? If not, you know, don't go there. Um, and 
and it's sort of like the recovery world where once someone is told what the problem is, then the patient has to do what they have to do, right? Nobody else can do it for them. And so the government can't do it for us, right? The, the, the whoever the leaders are can't lead us into the lives that we individually may be able to attend. That's work that we have to do. And there's too much in this world that smacks me uh, as trying to, you know, work on me from the outside in as opposed to the inside out. So th those, are, those are things that I kind of look for and ways to accomplish some of those things. I, I understand exactly where you're coming from, Peter. And I, I, I might have even mentioned it in the last interview that we did with regards to the importance of leading by example rather than telling people what to do. And I think that's more the angle that I would be willing to take. The... The, I've got a, a lot of ideas about how I would go about things, um, including looking the part, because I think, particularly in Australia, there's no fit, healthy looking politicians or very, very few. I can't mm. even really think. And uh, they're all they're all got a similar sort of jowl about them, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what their diet is. So you see like. what I would suggest, what I would suggest with that population is if we have, again, if we can paddle around those islands until we find the right beach, if we can give them the information that allows them to have the personal experience, these are people that already understand politics. They already understand where all the connections are. Once they see the picture from the personal, then they can begin adding the additional pieces to what they're already equipped and in place to do. And, you know, there's, there's nothing worse than a reformed smoker, right? Um, so you get those, you get those people um, to where maybe they cut down or eliminate the medications that they've been on. Maybe you get them down to fighting weight, you know, where they were in college as opposed to you know, whatever, you know, the, the, the changes in the physical appearance of people's faces and, and then, like you say, the energy, the feeling. Um, somebody, somebody said that, you know, nobody wakes up one day and realizes, oh my God, I'm obese. How did this happen? Right. It, it's a process that the, the, the you know individuals see this occurring over time and they try a number of things and if they've been listening unfortunately to the public health people those things haven't worked and you try and it doesn't work and that's demoralizing you try and that doesn't work you go to the doctor and the doctor thinks you're lying about what you've been doing right that's demoralizing and so and so and so if, if we can find these people and help them have success at restoring their health, that's tremendously invigorating. And like I say, if, if, if we can find the people that are already in place and, and help them restore their health, then that may be more effective then it would be for me because one, I'm not equipped for politics. I have no business going anywhere near it. And, and two, even if I were, I would still have to learn the ropes and the corridors and you know all the right doors and the secret knocks and all that stuff. So um, it's, it's just, that's been the approach that I've had um, as I've been trying to work with the industries that I was trained to support is to try to help the individuals in those industries to hear a message about metabolic health and then how the product of their industry can support that and support it on a national and global basis. Well, I, I you, you, you're inspiring me more and more as this conversation goes on to, to, to think more and more seriously about this, getting to the political arena, because, you know, even though that you say you're not, you know how to mobilize people around you to do the work that you're doing. 
And I think that might be one of my gifts as well, being able to forge relationships quickly. And because I think I'm quite, well, I am very, very honest and I'm very authentic in the way that I uh, come across. Uh, I, I would never say 100% perfect because that's just a ridiculous statement, which is mm. just the antithesis of, of what a politician is. And they've got all these skeletons mm. in the closet. I, on the other hand, would, would come from the other side. And because it's all on the table, no son of a bitch could hold anything against me. And I would use my networks to mobilize brilliant people like you to come and help with that reform and help with the re-education and be the, the shining light of, of example. And I, and, and scare people by saying, cause like um, Dr. James Mukey released a paper the other day, uh, Australia's on track to spend a hundred percent of its GDP on diabetes in mm. about 25 years. It's not far away. Yeah. Similar and that's something uh, you, you mentioned that a little while ago and I, I neglected to take you up on it. The demographic curves for the global population. So today with about seven, seven and a half, we'll call it billion people in the world. Apparently we've got something like 2 billion people, 15 years and under. And some of the projections say that by 2100, which is a long way down the track, we'll have nine and a half, maybe 10 billion. I've seen different numbers. We'll still only have 2 billion people 15 years and under. Same number as today. So it's not that we'll have more children it's that we'll have more old farts like me living into their 60s and 70s and 80s in places like Africa and, and Southwest Asia. Um, well, what happens as we get older is the metabolic illnesses are manifested more clearly, um, and certainly under current tracks. Um, we also know that we get less efficient at utilizing protein. And I'm sure as we look more and more, we'll realize that the human diet in older adults needs to be re-examined and certainly no longer think of 15 years and over as one monolithic recommendation. So um, that's yet another little piece to throw in here. Um, but what's the cost of losing those people now? Think about generational knowledge. Think about help in child rearing. Think about the value to society that is no, not capable of being realized because people are dying in their 50s and 60s instead of in their 70s and 80s. Um, so back to the point of... of we need to find our own place of influence and it's going to look completely different for different people and that's okay. Um, I, I do have a bigger picture in mind. Um, and, and so I encourage everyone to look for and do that. Um, you know, some of us are in a position where we can see these remarkable transformations in human lives. I mean, I think about the physicians that we could name who are deprescribing medications every day. Well, that's, that's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to be on, you know, well, wait a minute, who says that? You know, we, we, we see people who are on a trajectory that is leading toward decreasing health and they now equipped with information and resources are able to change that whole trajectory. Um, and, and there are other ways that that kind of manifests out that's really exciting and that's really remarkable. How do we get better at telling those stories? Because right now we have a lot of people that don't think that's possible. And so we need to 
we need to be better storytellers, I think. Um, we also, like I said, need to uh, maybe take a, a, a bigger look at what's going on and realize that <clears throat> I hear too much us and them in the world, and I contribute to that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wean myself off of that because there's just us. We come from different perspectives. We come from different realities. But at the end of the day, it's all human beings. And we're remarkably similar when we get down to it. Um, and I, I, I spoke with you last time about just the remarkable difference. You know, so in the mid-1700s, a young couple got on to, I have no idea what kind of boat, um, to emigrate to North America from what later became Germany. Young couple, husband, wife, two children. Um, the woman died on the boat and they threw her over the side. Husband died shortly after arrival in Philadelphia. The two boys were separated and raised by different families. Uh, a couple generations later, those families didn't, those, they didn't know about each other. And it was only in the 60s that those families got reconnected. Wow. That is my maternal line. So when we think about the things that had to happen for us to get to the places we're at. And then you think about all the invention and all the opportunities that people took to create the things that are now part of our life. This isn't accidental. It may feel that way from time to time. Um, you know, <laughs> In, 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 many, in many ways, I was born on third base, and I think I hit a triple. You know, I, we, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and we like to congratulate ourselves on the great heights to which we've risen. A little humility might help us as we go forward down the track. Um, so I, I don't know what all that contributes to the conversation at this point. Um, it's, it's 20 till the hour here and it's, uh, I'm approaching my pumpkin hour. Um, it's it, just to encourage people. And, and there's something else. There's, there's a whole lot of people in the world who find themselves in some form of addiction. I don't understand all of that. I do understand some of that. And what's really important for people to understand is that there is a solution and there are resources and people available to us. And I encourage people to take this moment and if there's some part of their life that is less than they would like it to be. If there's some part of their life that every once in a while, there's that little thing in the back of the mind that says, this ain't right. You know, I don't want to be doing this yet. I'm doing this. I said, I didn't want to do this again and I'm doing it again. Honor that observation and, and find help because if this is addiction, then by my experience, it's something that very few of us can break through on our unaided will alone. And willpower, in fact, becomes part of this downward spiral. And this is, this is part of this issue of, you know, it's, it's, it's not your fault, but it is your problem. And, and you need to find the, the help. Um, and like I say, there are resources, I'm sure in Australia, I know for certain in the United States. And it is something that I know about. 
Um, and so I've seen lives restored where there were legal considerations about you can't see them anymore. Um, I, I, you know, where people had had horrendous things happen to them and they've been able to get past all that and live as free and very productive people. Um, and, you know, the statistics are serious in terms of the number of people that are facing this. And so I see people who had struggled with uh, suicidal thoughts. And again, the encouragement, I, I heard somebody say the other day, it, it, you didn't want to kill the man, you just wanted to kill the moment. And so reach out and find whatever it takes to buy one more moment, to let, to let that moment pass. And we truly are only as sick as our secrets. And there's a lot of secrets that are at work in our society, North America, I'm sure not in Australia. I wouldn't, wouldn't <laughs> want to make any. Um, and so I, I, I want people regardless of what it is that they're facing. Um, you know, there's this mythology in the United States of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and, you know, the rugged individualist. And it's like, human beings don't work that way. We, we work as a part of a community, whether that's a physically located, you know, village somewhere, um, or it's um, dispersed like we are. I mean, this is remarkable that I can be talking to you from however many thousand miles away. Um, we, we need that, the, we need those relationships and we need communities that support us in what we're trying to do. And so some communities things like addiction, alcoholism, poor diet, lifestyle issues, whatever, those are endemic throughout. And if one person starts doing something different, the community isn't always supportive. We call it the crayfish syndrome in the United States. I don't know if you know what a crayfish is, a little freshwater lobster. Yeah, yeah. They call them crawdads over okay. there, don't they? Well, the depends it's a big country we you know damn texas and different it. so <laughs> yeah so if you have a can full of them and one begins to climb out others will grab him and pull him back in and human beings aren't that different sometimes mm -hmm. so sometimes we need to find place you know a, a different group to support us and a, a different community that allow us to change and, and then encourage us to do that. It's not always where we currently are. So those are just some things that, as I've thought about what I'd talk about between the end of our last conversation and this one, um, that's, that's something I think I'd like to leave people with is that kind of encouragement. And again, I didn't, I had no concept several decades ago <laughs> that I would be where I am doing what I'm doing. In fact, a decade ago, I didn't have this concept. Um, and it's only because I took initial steps and then met people and then opportunities came. And like you, you know, the doors open. So you walk through, you seem to be somebody that will knock on the door and push it open. And that's, that's great. Um, sometimes that's what it takes. Um, and, and the result is here I am and I get to hear remarkable stories frequently about the changes that have happened in people's lives. And that's just, that's like fuel. That's, that's something that allows me to keep going through these last several weeks where everything on my calendar just disappeared. 
everything, boom, gone. And all the things that were in front of me that I thought I had a really clear vision of what was going to happen this year. <laughs> and no. So, okay, now what? Do I just, was I wrong about all those things? Do I just let it all go? And, you know, it went through a little period where I just, eh, I don't really care anymore. Well, that's not true. I do. I just didn't know what to do with it. And then slowly over time, okay, you know, maybe it was spring that helped. I don't know. Um, but no, we have tremendous opportunity and we can call it carrying a message. We can call it um, any number of things. I mean, gospel it means good news. And I can't think of any better news to give someone than, you know, it isn't necessary that you lose your toes and then the rest of your foot and then your lower leg, which is a routine thing for people who are facing type diabetes and, and poorly controlled diabetes. Uh, it, women who have been struggling with infertility th through PCOS who find that by, you know, the acronyms SAD diet, standard American diet, I change that for species appropriate diet. And when people get on a species appropriate diet, remarkable things happen. So much so that some practitioners are telling their women patients, if you're not on contraceptive and you don't want to be pregnant, <laughs> you need to get on as you start this diet. Um, I heard one wonderful story, a woman who grew up in Africa, trained in Canada, went back to Africa. I think it was Tanzania that she was in. She was given the opportunity to, she opened her own clinic and she worked with women with metabolic health issues, but she got this, she, she, she said later she got this, this reputation because several of her patients who were in their, you know, early forties were getting pregnant who didn't want to get pregnant. Like they wanted to be done. <laughs> And so the, 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 don't, don't go to her. She'll get you pregnant. <laughs> Which doctor? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, just stuff like that. And again, it's global. You, you talk to um, Professor Noakes and what he's doing with Noakes Foundation in, in so South Africa. Um, and, and so can we put all those pieces together about how to enable species appropriate diet throughout the planet? And it's going to look different and it's going to cost different and all those things. But it's why should that not be an absolute top priority for all levels of policy and government people? Very wise words, Peter. And um, James Mukey also said that it's the mortality rates of when you lose your first limb to when you die is within usually about 12 months. I, I think I heard that the prognosis is worse than many forms of cancer following diagnosis. Yeah. Not now, now of course, it takes longer from potential diagnosis of diabetes to get to the amputation stage. And that's the good news too, is from what I understand, if we could get people to actually look at maybe some different markers like, for example, if we could actually test for insulin, which is a relatively inexpensive test, we might push the diagnosis 10 years earlier and really have an opportunity to intervene and avoid a lot of the accumulation of disease that we currently see. HbA1c, or whatever it's called. Is that the right one? Yeah. Yeah. But even that, um, it, it, that lags the the insulin response and so um someone explained that different ethnic backgrounds um you can see 
different patterns of response. And so, for example, Southwest Asians tend to develop the metabolic syndrome without the abdominal obesity. African Americans tend, this is what I've been told, tend, there, there are people within that community who hypersecrete insulin. And so if a middle-aged African American man shows up in the clinic, he's probably got a little abdominal obesity going. He's probably got some elevated blood pressure going. That's two out of the five for your diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. Um, but with the hypersecretion of insulin, that keeps the glucose in normal range. They don't include A1C. So it's just fasting glucose. And then the elevated triglycerides and depressed uh, um, high-density lipoprotein, those are so tightly related and travel together. Those also apparently are influenced by this hypersecretion. So now you've got three out of the five that won't show up for the diagnosis. So the doctor tells this patient, you need to eat less, exercise more. Maybe I'll give you a prescription for the uh, hypertension, send you on your way. And 10 years later, you'll come back as a full-blown diabetic. Had we tested, we might find that your insulin level is 10 times normal. And that if we could say, ah, well, what might, what sort of intervention might lower insulin? Uh, that might bias even more time to avoid the problem. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot, Peter. And maybe we should, I'll get you on my staff when I become prime minister of this country. <laughs> the, 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 well, there, there may be constitutional issues about citizenship and all that. <laughs> uh, well, I'll know a few people by then, Peter. I can pull a few strings and I'll have had to pull a few strings anyway, because being born in New Zealand, uh, there was, uh -huh. there's been a couple of politicians that have been, um, they had to go and just leave parliament for a while, leave the, resign from their positions and come back uh, that were born in New Zealand, even though they've renounced their citizenship. So mm. can I renounce my citizenship? That's the question on everybody's lips. Indeed, uh, that would be a tough call. Well, look, if it's for the metabolic health of the world, you know, some things are worth it, uh, I think. Yeah, no prices to <laughs> Now, Peter, you are going to be speaking at the Low Carb Denver uh, event, virtual event, later this year. Is that correct? Well, Low Carb San Diego, San Diego. Um, is the next one. one that's coming up the end of August, I believe. Um, yeah. So that's a Low Carb USA event. How do people find that particular event if they look for low carb usa on uh, social media they can find it um doug reynolds is one of the he's one of the leaders um and like i say if you google low carb usa i'm sure that that will return and they just started announcing um, ticket sales for the um, virtual conference. Brilliant. Well, there's, there is chapters all around the world, I think, certainly in low carb down, down under. And we look forward to the next time that you can be involved in person at one of those events. And maybe you'll get a chance to meet uh, Professor Tim Noakes. Put that on your bucket list. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I'm looking forward to that. And again, it's one of those conversations today, Peter, that I just feel like we could go down this rabbit hole for another two or three hours, but maybe we'll save it for a, another one further down the line. It's been an absolute delight once again. We thank you so much for your generous thoughts and your time and your passion towards something that's so near and dear to my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Bellastet. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure.